So I'm Rod Howe. I'm the executive director of the History Center. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, Pegasus, for taping this so more folks can see it. We appreciate that. Uh, as you can see, the current exhibit is called Made in Tompkins County. So we really had a concerted effort over the past several weeks to do programs on businesses and industry. In fact, the program that happened, I think about two weeks ago, really ended up being a sister companion to this presentation. It was on entrepreneurs then and now, and we ended up talking a fair amount about place and that this is a unique place and how that supports or can support entrepreneurs. We invite you to come back February 18th. It will really be our final program in the series as part of this exhibit. And it's going to focus in on the Ithaca Generator uh, and the maker space movement, uh, encouraging us all to make things uh, here in Tompkins County. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. Martha Armstrong uh, from Tompkins County Area Development has been great to work with. She really put it all together. I, I thought that I'd have to do more, but Martha just swooped in and made it all happen. So I'm going to turn it over to Martha. So thank you very much, Martha. Hi. So um, we are doing a session on place. As uh, Rod said, I thought I would just introduce myself really briefly. I work with Tompkins County Area Development, which is the county's economic development agency, which some of you know very well, and some of you may not have ever heard of us. We're upstairs here in this building. Uh, we've been in business for since 1964. I've been there for the last 20 years, which is like an incredibly long time. Uh, my background is I uh, went to University of Washington for BA in architecture. I got an architectural license and then I moved to Ithaca, worked here for a few years in architecture and I moved here because it was a cool place and <laughs> from New York City which was a little bit of an overwhelming place for me. And um, now I got a planning degree at Cornell and I've been working in economic development pretty much since then, a little bit of community development with the city. And so that's me. I'm going to introduce our panelists very briefly, and then they're going to say a lot more. Nick Nikitas, is, uh, his most recent venture is Rosie, and he'll be talking about that. But before that, he worked for a couple of uh, financial services, kind of technology firms. He worked uh, based in New York City and in Frankfurt, Germany, and he worked in those positions connecting with customers who were really all over the globe. Um, he has a BA in philosophy from Lehigh University. And he earned an MBA at Cornell, where he was a Freed Fellow and a Weill Entrepreneurship Fellow. Congratulations, Nick. I'm sure those are big titles. His hometown is Brooklyn, New York, and Old Greenwich, Connecticut. Two hometowns. All right. Uh, next, our second speaker will be Julie Baker with Ursa Space Systems. Uh, she's a co-founder there and the data operations. What was the word you had for that? Oh, okay. the the Duchess of Data, yes. The Duchess of Data at Ursa Space Systems. Uh, she's previously done a lot of R&D development work of uh, products in the uh, computer technology area, doing software engineering also at the um, Fraunhofer Institute for Manufacturing in Stuttgart, Germany for several years. So she's also a world traveler. She grew up near Houston, Texas, lived in the Southwest and in California. She has a BA in music from University of Texas in Austin and a master's of science in uh, computing science from Stanford University. She was a music teacher before she started taking some math classes, I think partly to get out of that teacher role. <laughs> and so that's a great background. Uh, Gary Willison, we're moving a little more local here. I'm moving progressively closer, I think. Uh, Gary grew up in Rochester, right? And uh, he started working uh, when he was a kid, uh, as I did, carrying a newspaper. That was one of my first paying gigs besides babysitting, was newspaper delivery. And then Gary worked in a, uh, a department store for a number of years where my sense is from the little bio you sent me that you actually really did on-the-job on training to become a manager in, in retail. Yeah, so I thought that was really a nice differentiation. We have a couple people with master's degrees, but we have somebody who really came up through the um, on-the-job training kind of ranks, and I love that. I love having a little diversity in that uh, because that's a, a great way, and a lot of people still, I'm sure, take that path. Um, he moved here to Ithaca almost 25 years ago, 1993. At that time, you probably had little kids, and they're probably all big kids by now. Uh, 
<laughs> and you've been an outstanding public uh, servant here in town, working with United Way, Public Library, Food Donation Network, Science Center, Hangar Theater, the list goes on. He's also on the TCAD board, as is Julie, so I'm pulling a couple people from my board today. And um, so we'll look forward to hearing your, your story with Wegmans. And Julie Crowley, uh, hometown girl, grew up here, multi-generational family in retail. Uh, you went off and did a few things in the interim. You got a, let's see, somewhere you have a, a bachelor's degree, which I've lost my thing here, in accounting, that's right, at Niagara University. Uh, did some work in Texas and, and Alaska in, I'm guessing the oil industry, both those locations. Yeah, and then went to BU to get a MBA, joint degree, MBA in management of information systems, kind of cool. Uh, combo degree there, again left town for a while, but came back and t is running the family business and picked up uh, gourmet coffee, which turned into Ithaca coffee, and we'll be learning more about that story in a minute. And just a setting for this, uh, Rod asked me to think about the p importance of place and in thinking about having people come speak to that question. Uh, historically, place often for business was about a commodity of sorts. You know, it was about coal mining and the, where the coal came from, and then you could have a manufacturing plant near there. Or even in Ithaca, we had water running down through creeks that was driving the mills. And so location was kind of about, you know, a very strong connection to the place as to what you could do with that place. You know, was the soil good enough to have agriculture? I mean, we still see that. The higher plateau, as soon as you get the north part of Tompkins County and there on up to Lake Ontario, you have great soils. And so you can have these huge dairy farms, you can have the grapes, you can have the you know, huge farms of beans and cabbage and that kind of uh, commodity growing that we have. That has to do with place. You get the south part of our county where it's all hilly like this, not so much farming going on. There's some valleys where it's fertile, but it's a whole different arena of what you can do there and what kind of resources are there. Shipping, transportation, that's been a huge history of place, and we do have a little bit of that in Tompkins County. Steamboat Landing, where our farmer's market is, was the steamboat landing, <laughs> and uh, we were shipping gypsum out of there in the late 1800s, late, sorry, 1700s, early 1800s. Um, I'm sure many other things were transporting in and out of there. Places like Chicago probably got there going with shipping lumber out through the waterways. And so there's these histories that are, have to do with the place and why things are there. But now things are kind of changing. And we actually, TCAD, one of the number one things for us for trying to retain really great businesses here is that the CEO likes Ithaca. <laughs> and that's really, really import, an important thing. So having a great quality of life, having great schools is very important for a company wanting to be in a place. Another big thing now is really the labor market. And depending what kind of company you, company you are, you might pick for different labor markets. So you might want cheap labor, you might want uh, you know, just sort of hardworking blue collar labor, you want, might want high skilled labor, like people coming out of Cornell, you might want um, you know, something else. You might want really diversity, you might need diversity in your company for some reason, or you might need multilingual people. Uh, so you, people are often, companies are really looking for where are the people that they need in a way, uh, as well as maybe some of those geographic things, but with little UPS trucks going everywhere and some products just going out over the internet. Uh, <laughs> you know, place is a very, very different thing. So I'll be curious to hear from each of you about how place matters to your company. And uh, we're gonna go with sort of about 10 minutes each, maybe a little more, a little less, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, if it gets to be 15 minutes, I'll probably be like waving, <laughs> giving you the signal, uh, but that'll be good. And then we'll have time afterwards to have a conversation with these really great business leaders. I really appreciate you all coming today. And let's start with Nick. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I thought I'd start out with our story, tell you a little bit about what we do. And then I think in telling that story, it'll, it'll kind of become very obvious about why Ithaca for our company. Uh, so, uh, Rosie uh, is the grocery industry's leading provider of e-commerce, data analytics, 
marketing, and delivery logistics. We focus entirely on this one segment of the market called independent grocers. So independent grocers are privately owned and operated businesses, and they're really the backbone of food security and food access in the U.S. At the, at the small end, it could be a one to two store retailer, a mom and pop shop, and on the larger side, it could be Wegmans, right? Up to 250 locations, up to 10 billion a year in revenue. That's really the segment of the market we serve. And so what we what we found is that grocers uh, and, and want to be able to transform and provide digital access to their stores because that's what customers really want today. So even in Tompkins County or really any of these small cities across the U.S., we want the convenience of being in a large metropolitan area. And grocers want to be able to provide that convenience, but they're not always able to. And the reason why is because they don't necessarily have technology experience, resources uh, that a Walmart or an Amazon.com or a Kroger has. And so our mission is really to help provide all those so that these, these individual independent grocers can become kind of micro Amazon.coms. And the reason we got so passionate about this idea was, uh, was two things. And it's a real personal story for me. So when I was growing up, I grew up in a, in a small town just like Ithaca called Old Greenwich, Connecticut. And uh, before the internet was around, if you guys remember, if you wanted to get the latest information, uh, you couldn't really go to your library because the library had a lot of older information. If you wanted new, new stuff, you had to go to a bookstore. And there was this local bookstore in town that I really loved. And they always had the best stuff and I could sit in there and not pay a dollar. I could just read anything I wanted in the store and they, they would tolerate me. And, uh, and I loved this bookstore. And then 1996 came around, and this company, Amazon.com, got founded. And within three years, uh, my local bookstore was out of business. And so as a young techie, I was always enamored with how technology could be so transformative. But at a very young age, I also learned that it could be very destructive as well. So in my mind, I was always thinking, like, how can you use technology to transform local businesses to allow them to succeed? Later on, about 20 years later, I'm going to get my MBA at Cornell. I had lived in Frankfurt and Manhattan, and I was used to grocery delivery services like Fresh Direct. My then girlfriend, now wife, and I used Fresh Direct all the time. We were busy working. We didn't have any time to go to the store, so we'd have our groceries delivered to our door. So I start my MBA at Johnson, and uh, within the first two weeks, all the uh, ingredients in my fridge, I think I had mustard and beer, and that was it. I just never had any time to go to the store. Uh, and I'm like, this is crazy. Why can't my local, why can't my local Wegmans, why can't the local PNC Fresh offer a grocery delivery service. And so uh, the last four years, uh, I've dedicated my life to try to solve that problem. And uh, in that time, we now have grown from just three individuals to uh, over 26 full-time employees. We service 100 retailers, uh, representing over 400 locations in 21 states. And we will add another 26 jobs uh, to Tompkins County in the next uh, 12 months. So we'll grow to over 51 people. Uh, both in Tompkins County and Boston. And, and so, so, so kind of how did we decide to, to stay here when you hear about a lot of startups that will incubate their companies in, in central New York and then once they achieve some level of traction and success, they relocate it. And uh, the way that it happened for us was we're getting ready to graduate from Cornell and, and, and now the company is successful, but at the time we were very cash strapped. And... Uh, we, we needed a place to go, and we couldn't afford to rent a building in Tompkins County or rent an office space. It was, it was beyond what we could afford at the time. And so we thought we'd have to move either to Palo Alto or to Boston. The investor said, if you move here, we'll give you office space, we'll give you cash. And then right as we were getting ready to graduate from Cornell, uh, the Rev Incubator opened up downtown. And we kind of parachuted down the hill, and then uh, our, our team of six worked out of that co-working space for the next six months. Uh, and we were mentored, and we were coached, and we worked through that phase of the business. Well, the company continued to grow as more and more retailers were succeeding our platform, and quickly we outgrew Rev. Uh, and we still couldn't afford uh, a rent downtown, but uh, the commons was still being under construction at the time, and uh, we were very lucky. A, a local uh, business, uh, businessman, Robbie Dean, who owns American Crafts down in the commons, gave us a flexible lease terms and a very, very competitive lease to move into a, a, a floor of his building. Uh, I mean, he really was a partner to us and got us into that space uh, long before we could really reasonably afford it and helped us kind of get our business to the next stage. And then very quickly, we, we rented the third floor of the building and then the fourth floor of the building, and, and we grew through the entire space with Robbie's support. 
After a while, uh, we started to outgrow the internet in that building. It was completely substandard for, for a technology company's needs. It was wired for home cable and, and DSL use. And so what do you do in Tompkins County when, you're, when your cable internet is no longer sufficient for your business? We called the mayor. <laughs> we called City Hall and the mayor and the engineering department uh, moved heaven and earth to run fiber internet access into our building so that we had, we were the first building in the commons in this like 18th century building now having fiber internet access coming in through, through the conduit under the newly, the newly laid commons. So even at that point with all the traction that we had generated and all the, as the team has expanded, uh, we still couldn't get investors to, to want to invest in Tompkins County. They said, look, you know, we get it, you're Cornell guys, you, you like the city, it's great, but, uh, Move to, move to Palo Alto, move to Boston. We will fund your business there, but we're not going out to Ithaca, New York for a startup. And, and we said, as we had every time, is that you know, we have a strategic advantage in this place. Uh, our community has really embraced the company. At every single checkpoint, they've supported us, they've invested in us, they've become our customers, they've become team members, they've become partners. Uh, if you invest in our company, Every dollar you invest is getting strategic advantage because of this community that we're a part of. And they said, yeah, but, but who's, who's willing to come along and, and, and prove that to us? And, and it was Tompkins County Area Development who was really the first economic development funding and, and they came in with uh, support from, from uh, Greater Syracuse Business Development uh, Association in, in, uh, in Syracuse and put together an initial tranche of seed capital that has since allowed us to generate tens of millions of dollars of revenue and also attract several million dollars of venture capital in Ithaca to continue to grow. So when you ask the question, you know, why Ithaca? I, I would say, why anywhere else? Uh, What's basically happened is there is an ecosystem that is forming, and maybe you're, you're now becoming aware of it through our story, but there are other companies like Ursa Space Systems and others that are, that are coming through this, this community that has really pulled together. And I think that when you look at the way entrepreneurship has evolved, you know, it really started in, in kind of, it was very polar through, through San Francisco, and then that model got replicated in Boston and New York City, New York City with financial services firms in Boston with the medical community. And now uh, entrepreneurship has become a driver of job creation across the United States. And, and what maybe originally, you know, when I always looked at Ithaca, why I moved here was, uh, and I was saying this to, to, to Gary before, you know, I looked at there's really three main places in the United States where computer science is, or computer scientists are being created. And it's Stanford in Palo Alto, it's MIT in Boston, and it's Cornell University. And if you look at the number of startups coming out of those schools, there is a disproportional amount coming out of Palo Alto and out of, out of uh, MIT, but there's very few startups coming out of Cornell. And the reason why is uh, typically because there's a lack of capital in the region that is investing in it, but there is no doubt that there is a tremendous amount of technical talent to be applied to startups. And so I saw this disequilibrium in the market and I thought, you know, starting a company in Tompkins County was gonna put it at a place where there was a lot of people that wanted to see uh, economic development and startups succeed. So I felt like I had a, an unfair competitive advantage against other startups that were in New York City or Boston because there's lots of them. Here, we were gonna be very special. We were gonna be a big fish in a little pond. And then there was a, a plethora of extremely well-educated, very talented engineers, the same people that are going to Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, NASA, Goldman Sachs, they're getting trained a few miles away from here. And so that provided this, uh, this talent pool. And then I figured that if we had the talent and we had the community supporting us to achieve traction, then bringing the investment here would be, would be, would be an easy thing to do. And I think what you're starting to see is the caliber of startups in this area continues to increase and improve. Our ability to draw and bring capital to the region has also improved. So when I project out you know, 20 years where I think this goes is Ithaca is gonna look a lot like uh, the Boulder venture capital community look, looks like today. Uh, Boulder has really become, I think, a model and a template for uh, secondary and tertiary markets like Ithaca that have a very, very highly educated uh, uh, populace with uh, 
an entrepreneurial spirit and drive, alignment between local economic development and community leaders to allow those companies to be successful. And then as time goes on and more of these companies succeed and grow and they plant roots in the area, I think capital, the flow of capital to Ithaca and other communities like this is going to continue to increase as we have seen in Boulder. So that's a little bit about why, why Ithaca from a, from a company standpoint. But the other thing I'd say, is, and, and quality of life gets brought up a lot, is that it becomes very important. I mean, the, the comments has become probably our biggest recruiting tool. We do a lot of our recruiting in the in the summertime where we can bring people down the commons and we'll do walk and talk interviews and people come by and they say, wow, this is, this is really amazing. And so what we found is that uh, to somebody who wants to live in the Bay Area or wants to live in New York City or they want to live in on the coast, they're not going to come to Ithaca. They have a different style. But if you're in Rochester or you're in Syracuse or you're in uh, other places, Kansas, other places across the country, Ithaca is like a pretty amazing place to live. And if you've lived in major cities and you said, you know, I don't really like the traffic or the subways and I want to have uh, a, a place to kind of swing my bat, raise a family, uh, one of the tools that I know that Ursa and Rosie use is that we always send the link to Zillow. Uh, and real estate listings to new hires. Uh, and whenever we're trying to attract somebody to come to Ithaca, we show kind of what the, the cost of living here is and the quality of life that you can, you can build for your family. So there's this kind of a, a, a critical mass that's happening in this area where people want to have, they want quality of life, they want to have a low cost of living, they want to be able to do really, really exciting jobs in the technology spa space. And I think for a business like ours that is particularly locally focused, I mean, we work with that, that local grocer to make them successful in the space. Uh, recently, we were, the, the USDA, uh, the Department of Ag, put out a program for offering food stamps online. And when they put this program out, it was specifically targeted for some of the largest grocers in the United States. And it was uh, no surprise to us that Amazon, Safeway, ShopRite, Fresh Direct, all got uh, accepted to participate in this program to accept food stamps online. What really surprised us was that two of our independent retailer partners, one being Dash's Market in Buffalo, New York, also got accepted to this program. And it, it shows that what we're doing now has kind of gone beyond just the local level that we're now pioneering the use of uh, really supporting food access and food security nationally and using technology as a solution to do that. So what started as a very kind of small idea and a pain point that I experienced when I was in school has gone on to uh, enable these local businesses to be successful, uh, to continue to invest in their communities. I think Gary will tell you that uh, independent supermarkets across the country are some of the biggest employers. They're also one of the biggest philanthropists in the area. They are constantly donating and providing back to the communities they serve. So to be able to partner with them is, has been really the passion of my, of my career and, and watch them succeed as they compete against Amazon and Walmart and these other market forces. But then also to now have created a business that's provided great jobs for uh, 26 people and soon to be 51 uh, in a community like Tompkins County has just been, has been terrific. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. I'm gonna hand it over to the other panelists, but thank you so much. Thanks, Martha and Rod, for the invitation to speak. I appreciate everyone coming out today. Get a chance to tell you a little bit about URSA and why Tompkins County is important to us. As you'll see, place is important to URSA at many levels. And let's see if this, this works. So at URSA Space, we're a data analytics company. We take satellite imagery. We do some image processing on it, and we deliver insights to customers. In particular, we use radar imagery. And this is an excellent example. I'm sorry everybody up here can't see the screen, but we've got on the left you have an optical image, and on the right you have a radar image of Ningbo, China, taken on the same day. And on the left, this optical image is a beautiful picture of clouds. <laughs> on the right, you see much more detail. You get very rich information from the radar. 
And what the beauty of the radar actually gives us is the power to deliver information reliably. So whereas other people might be using optical satellites and, and, and doing analytics on optical imagery, it may be months before they can actually get a clear image of a location that they're monitoring. For URSA, when we focus on the radar, we can reliably deliver products every week. So this is, this is the benefit of that. This is a simulation of all of the commercial radar satellites that we have access to now. And there are actually 12 commercial satellites in orbit. Effectively, we get a virtual constellation and can get information about anywhere on the Earth every 12 hours. You see they're going in sun-synchronous orbit from pole to pole, and they go over in the morning between 6 and 7 in the morning, and then again in the evening between 6 and 7. And this is what gives us the ability to get information twice a day. We go all the way from satellites to insights. We do all of the hard work for you so that the customers only need to get the, the answers and the insights. So we take all of those images and the data from the radar satellites that we have access to. Our team of image processing experts create algorithms to get the information out of those images and then we deliver it to the customers in easy to use intuitive formats that are really tailored to the application that we're, that we're providing and the kind of information that the customer wants to get. So we can provide reports, we can provide information on maps, and that here again, this is the place connection. And then an API where you can actually um, have a machine-to-machine -machine interface for people who want to do their own analytics. So an example of an easy-to-use interface is URSA Maps that we developed last year. This is a, a really interactive application where you click on the clusters and they open up. It even works on your mobile device. Very intuitive. It's an example of the kind of information we can provide. We can give you the volume of oil in these large tanks with the floating tops. So the radar can, can get that information when we process it. We can display it here. The vertical axis here on the, on the chart, if you can't, can't read those, um, faint numbers, those are the barrels of oil in the tank, and then across the bottom on the, on the horizontal axis is the um, date. On that particular date, we measured that volume, and as you can see, they change depending on what day you're looking at the tank. In the fall, we launched our first actual product. So this was, we got the most traction, the most interest in our oil storage. And we're delivering an oil storage report for Asia every week. So we're looking at locations in China and Singapore. The um, quote over there on the, on the right side of the screen is from Colin Fenton. We started working with Colin last year as, as an advisor to, to us because he came from, before he was at Blacklight Research, he was the, um, at J.P. Morgan Chase as a managing director in their commodities group, and he led their, I think he was the chief commodity strategist there. We, he recognized that, that this was the first time that satellite data could be reliable and be, be able to be used in looking at the analysis of the market. Oil storage is a real driver for demand. It's a demand indicator and really has an effect on the market. And China, being such a huge market, has, has a big demand and really was a black hole until we started delivering this information. We, we got a lot of interest from, from those, um, those uh, company or pr uh, publications at the bottom. And many of those you can see from our website. 
In addition to oil and gas analytics, the kind of product that we can deliver this oil storage report, there are so many rich uh, aspects of radar that can fuel these other applications in the future. For example, the um, maritime surveillance, we can see ships with the, in the radar images, we can detect the images, the ships and vessels. We can tell you how wide and how long they are and where they are when we see when we get those images. We can marry that with the automated identification system that ships are supposed to beam out, the AIS. So they are supposed to tell people, you know, people, other other vessels in the ocean who they are, what they what they're carrying, and how fast they're going, that sort of thing. So we can look at our radar images and then get more detailed information about the actual vessels. And this will actually feed back into oil flow because we can look at oil tankers and coming in and out of the ports. In terms of weather. There are a lot of places in the world that just don't get good weather information before you know, the big storms approach. So we're very fortunate in the United States, Australia, and Europe to have good weather systems, um, weather reporting. But once you get too far away from, from those countries and, and continents, the, um, the amount of information that you have really is limited and people will benefit greatly from advanced warning. In terms of agriculture, radar is really good at some properties of soil moisture, plant moisture, crop height and yield, and we can even tell the difference in certain plants like wheat and barley that are very similar to human, to the human eye, but they show up very differently in a radar image. And we can help farmers increase their yield with all of these kinds of, um, all of this information. And then in terms of uh, first responders, after natural disasters like earthquakes and tornadoes, we can build change detection maps to help the first responders know where to go. And in the Midwest, the tornadoes come through usually, typically at dusk, and it's, the optical satellites have already gone over because they come over during the middle of the day. The, you can't put an airplane or a drone in the air. You know, the weather is really too bad, so you can't get a good aerial view to, to really get your um, sense of what has gone on. And with the radar, we can, we can tell people where to go. And then the last one is the insurance market. The um, radar imagery has very good properties um, for, for water in particular, and we can, we can tell how high the water is and the extent of flooding. So an insurance company would know how many agents to send out, or they might not even have to send agents out if they could recognize that certain policyholders had been affected by the flooding. So why did we end up in Tompkins County? So we, we uh, were started by Adam Maher, who was living in the Bay Area a couple of years ago, the fall of 2014. And Adam is from upstate New York, so he had insight into all of the, the jewels and the resources in the, in the region, particularly Cornell. He had gone to Cornell, majored in mechanical engineering. He worked with Mason Peck, who's in charge of the small SAP program there. And Mason had been talking to Adam about all of the talent that he was generating and how important it was for his students to have a place to work locally. And there, as Nick mentioned, there's so many other great talent coming, coming out of Cornell as well. Imaging science is really important to URSA, and we pull greatly from the uh, um, Carlson Imaging Science School at RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology. And a few years ago, the Air Force Research Laboratory's sensors directorate used to be 
par partially headquartered in Rome, New York. And there's a lot of industry that was um, developed around Rome with, with a lot of radar expertise. And a lot of those companies are still in the area and they have a lot of um, personnel and, and expertise um, in, in uh, regarding radar. And as Nick mentioned, the REV startup incubator uh, was established in the fall of 2014 by TC3, Cornell, Ithaca College. And that was another, that was actually where I met Adam. And uh, one of the entrepreneurs in residence, Brad Treat, introduced me to Adam when, when Adam came to REV. And um, we were actually working alongside Rosie for about a year and a half and re graduated and moved into this building. And as, as Nick mentioned, the housing costs were, were uh, much lower here and it is a big draw for people who want to own their own homes. You know, if you're living in the Bay Area, you, you can hardly even afford an apartment, much less a home. And Adam knew that moving his family here, he would be able to afford a home. So that basically wraps up my presentation about URSA and why we are in Tompkins County and all of the great reasons. And traffic is another one, too. You can get across, you can get across Ithaca in 15 minutes most of the time. So thank you very much. I'm Gary Wallison. I'm store manager of the Ithaca Wegmans. I've worked for Wegmans for 36 years. Uh, we just celebrated our company's 100th year anniversary. Um, you know, a little different than these rookies over here. <laughs> but uh, again, a lot of the same excitement, you know, the aspect of who we are and what we could be, uh, how our companies are growing, a lot of similarities and just the excitement in their voices. Uh, we're very proud of being a New York State homegrown business. I asked Robert once, uh, we were having lunch and he showed up during a snowstorm and I said, for the love of God, why, why are you here? And he said, well, I mean, no one was in the store. There were no customers. It was probably six inches of snow and slush. And he goes, well, I don't drive. Someone drives me all over the place. And I love coming to visit. And uh, I said, well, even beyond being here on a snowy day, why are you in New York State? You could be anywhere you want to be. And he goes, I love this place. He goes, I grew up in New York State. Uh, I... I love seeing the people that work for this company and I'd never go anywhere else. So, you know, that's kind of his commitment to our state. Uh, revisiting why we chose to come to Ithaca is timely because we've been pulling out a lot of our history. You know, uh, what have we done over the last hundred years? What have we done in each location that we've been in? We've been celebrating individually, store by store. And as fate would have it, uh, one of my previous assignments with Wegmans back in the 80s, I was on a focus board as we decided on whether we should build a store in Ithaca in the first place. Uh, didn't know that how any of this was going to turn out. Uh, some of you may remember that we had an original store in Ithaca. We opened it in 1988. Uh, nine years later, we demolished it and built the current store that we have. Certainly, there were many things to consider when we built our first store. Uh, we were and still are. Uh, we're considered a small grocery chain. We have 92 stores. Uh, I remember sitting with Danny at one point. He goes, I don't think we'll ever have 100 stores in my lifetime. That was years ago. And uh, we will have 100 stores <laughs> in this lifetime <laughs> with the rate we're building stores. Uh, we just happened to build large stores, and we have a mantra of one-stop shopping. And that was a concept that Robert Wegman and Danny Wegman put together in the late 70s as far as converting our stores to a super center, if you will. Uh, we were actually having internal discussions on building an Ithaca in 19... Uh, 1984, four years before we ever built the original store. Um, you may keep up on Wegmans, and you know our Consumer Affairs Vice President is Mary Ellen Burris. Uh, Mary Ellen worked for Co Cooperative Extension before she ever came to work for Wegman. So she was lobbying Robert as this could be a good place to consider. Uh, 
And when they looked at Ithaca and they looked at the area and why we originally built in Ithaca 30 years ago, uh, we were impressed with the diversity of the region, the educational background, and the acceptance and appreciation of great food. Uh, we are successful as a company because we, we have a lot of items for people to choose from. And we enjoy doing uh, marketing to areas that would appreciate something of that nature. Later, when we rebuilt our current store, we built a prototype store. When we built the store that is on our site here, we had we did not have a two-tier store anywhere in the company. Uh, in fact, when we went to our city planning department and brought them blueprints of what we were going to build in Ithaca, it was a single-level store. It just took so long to get through the red tape. Uh, Danny came up with this new concept. And they're personally involved with it, just as these folks are with what it should look like, what we should be doing, and down to choosing the floor tiles and choosing the wallpaper, uh, the layouts of the department. I sat in Danny's office with them for weeks with a blank blueprint, writing things in and erasing them and starting all over again. Uh, again, there were a lot of market factors, as there is today, in the 90s that were evolving, both with technology and with the direction groceries were going. Uh, frozen dairy products, refrigeration, was expanding the people who actually uh, would wholesale to us. The lines were, I mean, when I grew up as a kid, the only frozen meal you had was Swanson Hungry Man meals. You had one <laughs> choice. And uh, if you look at the frozen departments now or the dairy departments now, just the depth of selection, uh, incredible. And, and stores weren't built in those days to actually market those products to people. So uh, we have a corporate philosophy. And, and this was kind of the time that we decided that we would, we would address building a store using the corporate philosophy. And I thought I'd bring some uh, more powerful folks to share the I am a merchant statement with you. This is Robert's statement. So you don't mind playing it? Robert Wegman and Danny, yep. Whenever I've wondered about what to do, I've gone back to an address that my dad may have never delivered. Uh, <laughs> But I think it's the greatest speech I've ever read, and I continually go back to it. And we've uh, come to call it the I am a merchant speech. And it reads, I'm just going to read an excerpt from it. I am a merchant, and I have, therefore, my own philosophy, own philosophy about, merchandising. about merchandising. And that, that is to do something no one else is doing, and to be able to offer our customers a choice they don't have at the moment. This is the only reason for being in business. My way of thinking, this is the only way it should be. I think that uniqueness gives one an opportunity to make a profit. Good merchandising resolves itself into rendering a service in such a way as to be difficult for your competitive editors to emulate. This is the basic premise in which we at Wegmans operate. So for uh, decades, we've used that speech that was never given as, uh, as a benchmark on what we do and why we do it. Uh, it actually transcends the grocery business. I mean, it, it, when you look at any type of business, being able to offer uniqueness, being able to do it to the best of your ability gives you an opportunity to be successful. Uh, you know, I, I probably watch this six times a year for the last uh, 20 years. So it's a, it, it's a nice way for us to understand what we're doing in the company. And when we built this store that we have on Meadow Street, uh, we use this philosophy. Examples of the entrepreneurial decisions 
in the new store were many. Robert and Danny launched an executive chef program. Um, we didn't have an executive chef in our company before we built the store. And I remember sitting with Danny for months in his office talking about the purpose and how we would, what would it be a job description and what would be the expectations and how would we measure success on that individual. And we really never came to an understanding before we hired them. We said, let's just hire these folks and we'll see. But hiring chefs that work for five-star restaurants, people from the Hilton or the Ritz, our first executive chef of the sort down here uh, was with the Ritz in, uh, in Detroit. Uh, when we interviewed him, we moved him to Ithaca. He was a Canadian citizen, actually. So he had a green card. I don't know if he could get into the country <laughs> today, but uh, he's, uh, he's a vice president at, at corporate at this point in time. He moved through the stores and he works for our corporate office. But again, the expectation happened after he was on board. Uh, so it wasn't only to deliver high quality food and recipes to our customers, but it was to be embedded with our employees. Uh, to be a mentor to the entire staff of the store. And to this day, that's how our chefs interface. Um, some of you may hear Mike Washburn on the radio uh, for over a decade. He's had a radio talk show of uh, calling to the chef and enjoys it. He loves it. I try to have other people do it, and he fights me tooth and nail to still be able to, to be on the radio. Uh, but he loves interfacing with people. And one of Danny's thoughts at those points is where where do you get to talk to a chef? Where do you get to actually ask someone about the recipes, the you know, the, the different type of taste that you're trying to blend. Maybe you have it on a, you know, a, an old recipe, a family recipe, but you don't really understand why the things work the way they work. So when you find someone who's culinary trained, who loves food, just literally they they absorb uh, not only magazines, but shows and books, continual learning. Uh, it really gives us, as Robert was saying, the opportunity to do something nobody else is doing. Uh, beyond that, we, we uh, asked them to do a step more, and it was to put themselves into the community, to, to actually be a resource for the community. And Michael was just sharing with me today, he had a, a group come through from Cordell yesterday. Uh, well, I was out of the store, he goes, you know, I know you wouldn't mind, but I took a group of, one of the professors called and asked him to show some visitors from Japan our store. And that happens probably uh, at least half a dozen times a year, you know, whether there's folks from South America, whether there's people from uh, Asia, whether it's ironically even competitors. Uh, Michael also will go up to Cornell and he'll lecture in the hotel school or at the nutrition classes and share his thoughts and his knowledge with people that are uh, <clears throat> either learning it at the first point or uh, maybe just want to enhance it. We work very closely with TC3. Uh, we've worked with the Cultivari. In fact, next week we have another meeting with uh, Carl and his team to keep the interface going between our company and TC3 to help those students at least consider a culinary direction through Wegmans. And not just our store, uh, whether it's the Southern Tier or the stores that we're building. Uh, beyond the chef concept, we, uh, we expanded in our new store here back 20 years ago, we expanded the cheese programs. And people said, well, why do you need 600 types of cheese? <laughs> uh, but again, there's cheese from all over the world. There's all different uh, methodologies of producing this product. And it was something that we interfaced with, not only local people, but our, our <coughs> people we import from. So over the years, our relationship grew, and we decided we could do a better job with imported cheese, and we were, could do a better job with local New York State cheese producers if we help them ripen. Uh, if you know anything about the cheese making process, producing it, farming it, whether you're goats or sheep or cow, 
is a portion of it. Ripening cheese is at least 50% of it to do it right. And when you're importing cheese from France or Italy or Switzerland, wherever you, you're subject to a lot of things that are totally out of your control. It has to be shipped at a time that, okay, if everything is just right, it will get there in time and you'll be able to deliver customers proper cheese if Amazon does it right, right? <laughs> uh, but Danny said that it's not good enough. We, we should be able to deliver consistent product to our customers. So we built, for really the first time in this country, a cheese ripening center up in Rochester. And we nicknamed it the Caves. Uh, we actually went to, or we being the wee big Danny, uh, went to France and hired a cheese expert. Uh, someone who actually worked in the caves outside of Paris to ripen cheese. And he brought him back to our country and he said, teach us how they do it in Europe. So we have a, a real uh, program they put in place. It isn't just the room, it's humidity control, it's moisture control, it's uh, air control. They took a tour on it. You think you're in uh, one of your clean rooms, if you will. Uh, with your booties on and your mask on and because you can't have anything affecting the cheese as it's ripening. So again, it was a process that we put into place not only to help with our imported cheese and make sure that that product is delivered at just the right time, but we also work with Cornell Egg School on developing local farmers. And Danny does believe that these ranchers in town are all in New York State, I should say, have the capacity of growing to be a cheese capital as Wisconsin maybe, but with gourmet cheeses. So there's a few farmers that we're working with uh, in the region. Uh, there's one up in Rochester called First Light. Many of you know Lively Run or Old Chatham and Yancey's Fancy are a few of the ones that we've been working with. But again, this is a kind of fledgling program and for the future, we're going to see more and more opportunity for these folks to understand the teamwork we're doing with Cornell. Uh, Wegmans actually funded the Ag School to set this program in motion. So they screen the farmers, they check their uh, procedures, and then we make agreements on how we're going to merchandise their products in their store. On the grocery side of the store, when we built our new store, um, and this was, this was kind of interesting. We had this one segment that said international. And I asked the buyer when we were looking at the blueprint, I said, what is that? He said, well, that's our kosher section. <laughs> I said, oh, because that's about the depth we had back in 1993 as far as what we had for international food. Uh, and I said, well, that's not gonna float. You know, I mean, not that size, not this program. We, Sure, we need kosher product, but it has to be, it has to have some meat on the bones. So we actually put together focus groups in Ithaca, and Cornell helped us with that. The Japanese American Society, the Korean Society, uh, we put together groups that told us what they wanted to, gee, could you bring this in? This is what I ate in my country. This is what we had in our country. And they gave us input, so it was kind of reversed. Instead of us telling customers, here's what we have for you, this group of people said, can you find this? And it was pretty difficult. There weren't a lot of importers for some of the things they were looking for. But throughout the years, uh, we've streamlined the program. We be, became uh, much better at it. We have experts at store level. And our buyers up at corporate became experts at that product. And as we moved into other communities, as we moved into the Princeton area or the Fairfax, Virginia area, uh, we had kind of a template for how we could be successful in those areas. Uh, lastly, and th this is part of our tradition, if you will, as a company, and it's been that way for, for that hundred years. We've always been part of our communities. Robert believed that there was a cyclical nature to strong communities, that communities that support nonprofits, communities that support schools and museums, that get engaged uh, communities that right down to the grassroots level that 
those are successful communities. They're great places to do business because it's a cyclical return all the way through. Uh, it kind of matches our own values. We have those hanging in our, all of our conference rooms, what Wegman's values are and what the expectation is. So uh, I'm very proud of the company's efforts in Ithaca. I think you mentioned a number of them initially. Uh, I'm proud of how our employees engage. If you happen to go to the store in uh, the next few weeks, I, I know you'll be asked if you want to support the food bank. Uh, Wegmans, you know, the food bank check out the hunger program is not Wegmans. It's a New York State program. It's something that comes out of Albany that the governors ask all grocers to get behind. Wegmans in New York State, Wegmans customers, I to clarify, support 80% of that program. And we don't do 80% of the business in New York State, but that program is supported. Uh, through the generosity of our customers uh, to such an extreme level that they, the food bank uh, can't really survive without the efforts that we do. So uh, thanks if you happen to be in the store shopping and you, you make a donation. Uh, lastly, I'm, uh, again, as I say, with our community uh, and our employees engaged, since I've been in it, my family's been engaged in it. And uh, my wife has been involved with the United Way, with friends, uh, the library. My sons were involved with the United Way while they were at college. In fact, my uh, older son, unbeknownst to me, became one of the gallon donators of blood for the Red Cross. So I think if you walk the walk, and that's what I see with Danny and Robert and Colleen, uh, we get the results, we get a strong community, and we're able to all to pull together. So, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. And uh, Wegmans is awesome, right? What can we say? <laughs> Julie Crowley, Ithaca Coffee, also awesome. Hello. Uh, I own Trip Amber Wines and Spirits and Ithaca Coffee Company. And I'm here because in uh, Ithaca Coffee, I'm here and Ithaca Coffee Company exists because my grandparents owned a, uh, opened a liquor store on 222 and one half South Cuga Street in 1941. So there was like an auto repair right behind there and I believe the building was not big enough for a bathroom. So that's where we started. And then in my lifetime, my father um, it moved the business up to the Trip Hammer area and, uh, um, and built that business up. Uh, and this year we uh, celebrated our 75th anniversary of the liquor store. So that's, that's something. Um, so I'm the third generation. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, I attended Lansing schools. Um, I'm one of those that left for 20 years and came back. Uh, I got an accounting degree from Niagara. I went to work in Houston as an entry-level accountant for Standard Oil and got transferred up to Anchorage. And I was in Anchorage for... I promised I'd save, stay for two years, and I stayed for nine. Uh, and then uh, went to Boston University, got an MBA and a master's in MIS, and moved to Portland, Oregon, um, and did work as an enterprise systems consultant. Then in 2001, the bottom fell out of the market. 9-11 um, happened, and I fought hard about coming back home. I think a lot of people did at that time. So I say my business uh, success here is based on relative ability, which is something I learned in graduate school. Uh, my father built up a nice business at Trip Hammer, um, growing with the development of the wine industry and certainly the Finger Lakes wines, which speaks to place. Um, he was established in the community with customers and vendors. Um, he was honest and trusted and uh, had seen a number of liquor stores come and go over the years and you know, persevered. So when I came back, we were in a good position to grow the business. So after crisscrossing the country, I came back in 2002. Um, the AMP, if you've been around for a while, you remember the AMP up at the Turp Hammer Mall had just left. So um, I said to him, that'd be a good opportunity. And he felt like he was getting a little old to do that. So that's kind of why I came back and joined him. Uh, so we moved into that a portion of the space in the AMP in 2002, more than doubling the size of our store, more importantly putting the warehouse behind the store, 
So you can actually bring it in the back and go out the front, which wasn't the case previously. We were hauling stuff from the other end of the mall. Um, so over the next 10 years or so plus, we you know kept adding to the business and improving it. Um, uh, one of the things we added was, uh, I think we have one of the, the best wine tasting bar in the area and a very loyal clientele for our um, you know, frequent wine tastings. And then and for 10 years in that space, I wanted to do something nice. So we built a really nice you know, wine bar there with counter height. And my father looked at that and looked at the budget and said, what are you doing? <laughs> You're not selling a glass of wine. But uh, he did agree in the end. It's a nice, uh, um, certainly generates revenue from people coming in and tasting wines, and, and it looks good. And since then, we've added um, a couple of wine stations. So you can t there's eight bottles you can taste anytime. Um, so, and uh, one thing we used to do is host wine seminars in, in our back room. Um, it's a little kind. We do serve alcohol, so we're conscious of you know over serving and and all that sort of thing. And uh, this, this is something we want to bring back this year. We're not allowed to, uh, to charge for it, so it's something we need to figure out how to open it up to the people who really want to learn about wines. These are snapshots from our anniversary party. I think these are from our 75th anniversary party last year. So we usually do a party in April, uh, have a big wine tasting throughout the store. We've got really good at setting up the tasting, breaking it down. We have a nice group, keep it short enough where people can have a good time, but it's still, you know, midday, and um, so that's been very successful. Um, we've been big supporters of the uh, Finger Lakes wine region. Um, my father was an early supporter, and a lot of the winemakers at the time really appreciated that. So we moved into the new space at, at Trip Hammer. I tried to make the New York State wines front and center. It's one of the first things you see, um, and we stock quite a few of the wineries. Um, each summer, we, uh, the staff plans a few trips, so we go out to the winery and visit and get to know the winemakers and the owners, and um, we have monthly specials, so we're featuring a winery. They come in and do uh, tastings frequently, so we like to support them. Uh, then just uh, in 2004, so we moved in 2002, and 2004, I thought, well, yeah, things are pretty settled. Why not? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to shake it up. Um, so there was a gourmet food store, the Gourmet's Delight, if people remember that, um, which was a small, they would, were a coffee roaster and sold gourmet foods. Um, so he wanted to get out of the business, so I bought that. And there was still a space next to us, the store next door, <laughs> space next to us, at, uh, next to the liquor store. So we have the common entrance, and you turn one way for the liquor store, the other way for a coffee company. I thought, what could be easier than adding complimentary products? So in the liquor store, you can only sell wine and spirits. So we'll sell beer, cheese and crackers, uh, you know, gourmet foods, roast a little coffee. What could be easier? Well, just about anything <laughs> <laughs> would have been easier, and it's been in, in quite a learning curve. So. And we sell, I say, we sell the fun things, the things that make you happy. So it should be a fun place to come. Um, I was thinking about that as, as you guys are speaking. You know, your businesses certainly are good for our business. We're here to create the you know quality of life and, and add to that. And Gary, we're a, a vendor of yours and also uh, a competitor in, in, in some level. So it all, it all go, goes together. Uh, the coffee company is Gourmet Foods, Candy, Coffee Roaster. You know, hard goods. Um, we do a lot of gift basket business. Um, that is, that's a picture of the coffee company. It's a little busy. Um, that's the cafe. So, one, one th when I bought the Gourmet's Delight and moved it in, we wanted to add a cafe to be able to feature our fresh roasted coffee. Um, and we added, uh, had a grocery beer license so we could sell craft beer for off premise. Um, we didn't know how to run a cafe, but we didn't let that uh, slow us down. Um, the first year, we found out that uh, you can't order Christmas stuff in November. You have to actually order it in June. So, you know, so, yeah, there's a learning curve. Um, my first manager made it from June when I bought the business to October. So, you know, we had new management come in and, and for the holiday season. So, uh, you know, we learned a lot. 
our landlord helped us finance a new uh, coffee roaster when we moved into that space. Um, so we were able to be up and running. So once again, things are going pretty good, so why leave it be? So in 2007, we opened the Gateway location over here. And if you recall, that's the year that they closed the Aurora Street Bridge and practically Green Street to, to build the apartments. So we had a, we had a rough start there. Um, we also tried to replicate what we had at Trip Hammer down at Gateway and found that it's just a totally different market. So it's kind of evolved over the year. People walk in now and say it's great. Well, that, that, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, and we're still working on it because this area has changed so much since we've been down here. There's more residential, more apartments. Um, we added a tavern to the Gateway location. This is actually a picture of Trip Hammer, but we added a tavern down here in 2009, I believe. Um, so we add, you can buy a glass of beer or wine. Um, and it, it's turned into kind of a, a little hangout after work. Um, people sit back here during the day, have a cup of coffee. Um, we still close at nine. It's not a, a late night bar. And so we did the same thing at Trip Hammer in 2012. You would have thought the State Liquor Authority had never heard of it before when I already had one from 2009, but their first answer is always no. I said, they're like my father. The answer is no. Um, but so we added the, the Tavern of Trip Hammer in 2011. By 2013, uh, our coffee roasting operation is in the back of the Trip Hammer store. We had outgrown that, and we also needed more room for the tavern and for the craft beer. So we uh, bought uh, 702 Hancock Street with the help of TCAD, I believe, and uh, moved our coffee roasting operation uh, to this site. And then in, in two th the next year or so, we added a, a bakery so we could supply our cafes. Um, and in 2015, we added a new um, coffee roaster. That's a picture of our, our actual coffee roaster in front of our coffee roaster. <laughs> Uh, 110. Our old one was like 36 pounds. Yep. Yep. So, um, and one thing we do uh, contribute quite a bit to the community. Um, our big event is an evening to remember, which is a gala to raise awareness and funds for Alzheimer's. Um, my mother had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I wanted to be able to do something. Um, so we founded that in 2007. Uh, last year was our 10th anniversary, and to date we've raised over $300,000, most of which went to the Alzheimer's Association in Central New York. But we do keep some funds locally to fund caregiver training and like Music in Memory, which is a program from IC to provide, you know, like uh, music and earbuds for people, and it's been very successful. Um, and for a number of years, it was at the Trip Hotel, if anybody's been by there recently. Uh, <laughs> but we had to do it at the Statler Hotel, which is a beautiful facility. Um, branding, our Denny, obviously, the Trip Hammer Wines and Spirits is branded by their location. We're on Trip Hammer. People know how to find us. We've been here for 75 years, so that speaks to our connection to the community. Again, we give back quite a bit. Um, and most of our employees uh, live in Tompkins County. We do have some from outside, but you know, I live here, um, and the number of employees we have under 50. That's like I say. That's the goal: keep it under 50. Um, and we branded our coffee business Ithaca Coffee Company. So obviously, we identify with the Ithaca market. Ithaca has appeal outside of um, Ithaca as well. And uh, as a store name, we struggle because Ithaca Coffee Company doesn't really tell you the, the breadth of what we have in the store, so that's something we need. We're, we're, we're thinking about how, how to address that, but the coffee would always, we own the brand Ithaca Coffee, we have brand recognition, and that's not gonna go anywhere. So, and this, I don't know where that came from, but there's our identity to Ithaca, the Ithaca Gorgeous can we just put out last year, which I think turned out really nice. And I think it's selling pretty well. Wegmans is doing all right with it. And it's just a nice group photo we have. This is the liquor store and the coffee company. This is a couple years ago, so the crowd's a little bigger now. But um, 
Anyway, that's my presentation. Well, thank you, panelists, again. A wonderful array of uh, business experiences and philosophies and what you do and how you're connected to Ithaca. Uh, all great. So I just, we've got like 15, 20 minutes or so, however long. And uh, do folks want to ask some questions? When Adam was looking for a name for the company, he had the vision of a constellation of satellites. And he actually looked through a children's book of constellations. And when he came to the Ursa constellation, it's the bear, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper. But the bear is the Cornell mascot. And so that was an immediate connection for him. So that's how we got the name Ursa. Yeah, I think no matter what story you're in, the folks really feel unique. Yet, uh, I could speak for the family because uh, I've known them for so long, and, and I'll just tell another little short story. But a few years after we opened, uh, I came in one Saturday morning and went upstairs, dropped off my stuff, and was cutting through the upper cafe. It's probably quarter to eight on a Saturday during the summer, and I looked towards the railing towards bakery and Danny was leaning over the railing staring into the store and I said uh, what are you doing here <laughs> it's uh, usually they'll call and say you know here I'm coming down for a visit or whatever but this was bright and early in the morning and he was just staring at the store he said well I, I just came down to think I said well Dan there's a uh, there's a thousand places to think between here and here today, but <laughs> it, uh, before 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. So there's something a little deeper. And he said, yeah, yeah, there is. He goes, let's go get some coffee. So he went downstairs, got coffee, came back, and sat at the railing. And uh, sat for a couple hours, actually. He said, you know, we're days or weeks or months away from making a decision to move into New Jersey. And how do I pick this store up with its customers and its employees and drop it near Princeton? <laughs> he said, I, I just love this place. And there is a, a family connection with it. There was back to Robert, uh, as Robert did all of our site analysis when he was with the company and he chose the site in Ithaca, chose the site in Corning, and chose the site in Binghamton. And he would frequently tell the district supervisor, why don't you take the weekend off? I got your stories this weekend. Uh, and, and we lost that connection when Robert passed a little bit because both Danny and Kelly are so busy. But th there's a special place in the Southern Tier for the family. They truly appreciate the feeling of it, they, the uniqueness of it. Uh, it was interesting hearing the conversations about Boulder because uh, in 93, when I came here, Danny took me for a walk through the old store and said, uh, have you ever been to Boulder? And uh, he goes, this Ithaca reminds me so much of Boulder. And I said, no, I haven't. I've been over it and under it, but I've never stopped at Boulder. And then he showed back up in September and he said, have you ever been to Boulder? And I said, Danny, I've been here seven days a week since I moved here. He goes, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. And uh, December rolled around. And his admin called me and she said, uh, Gary, Danny wants you to apply to Boulder with him. And I said, this is my first year here. I, my first Christmas. I, I can't leave the store. And uh, she said, oh, okay, I, I understand. What do you want me to do with your tickets? And I said, my tickets? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, when is the ticket for? And she said, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. out of Rochester. <laughs> So I ended up flying to Boulder in uh, 1993, December, with Danny, and to look at what you folks compared. And he had the same thoughts. Uh, you know, we visited uh, the Alfalfa, which is the green star of Boulder, and went and had a chair massage in their aisle, and <laughs> had uh, shots of wheatgrass. And, and again, it really trying to understand the culture from Boulder and how it related to this. And uh, what we brought back actually was organic vegetables. We didn't carry organic vegetables in our company. And he saw them out there because Kelly went to school out there. And uh, he said, well, would your customers appreciate organics? 
I said, they don't ask us for it. They don't, I guess they don't expect it, but no one asked for organics back in the early 90s. And uh, we went to Green Star and talked to the store manager and he brought us in the back room with his produce manager and he connected us to their suppliers. He said, uh, you know, we get terrible product coming in that's like a bruise that's small, it's old. And if you start buying it, maybe we'll get better product coming in for our customers. And uh, after a few months, they actually asked us to buy from the supplier to uh, Green Start. They actually go to Boston and source our own product, but they connected us all the way. So the folks at Green Start have always been community minded. They wanted the best product for their customers. And again, you see that connection that we have here, you know, carrying with the coffee or doing different things with um, the locals, whether it's Ithaca Tofu or Ithaca Hummus, that if there's a way for us to connect and help other folks, we're, we're always engaged that way. Thank you. That's a kind of wonderful story about how we're like, more like an intramural set of teams here. Like it's okay, we can be competitive, but we also have like this, I think there's a real energy in the Ithaca area and even in the bigger region here in upstate, like, okay, we gotta, we can jostle a little bit, but actually if we're all lifting and all doing better, that's, we're all gonna do better. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting story about working with Green Star where I would have thought you would be like just head to head or you know, you've got Ithaca Coffee, you're a little bit competitive, but you're also, you know, you're carrying each other, you're carrying products from Ithaca Coffee at Wegmans, that kind of thing. Um, any other questions out here? I saw a few other hands out here, here you go. Oh, impresses me that we went 75 years. Um, and 75 years and that I'm the third generation owner. Um, we definitely put some, you know, stock in that. And I think there's appreciation for that. And, you know, people still remember my dad. Um, and uh, so it definitely is a connection. It was our 75th anniversary, so we made the most of that. So. For our 75th anniversary, we did three bottles of wine, a red, a white, and a sparkling wine. And we put pictures of like the three generations on there. Yeah, so that was fun. So we'll be recruiting from inside Tompkins County for certain positions, uh, and then we'll be also attracting uh, from other places as well, so from all over the U.S. I think that uh, doesn't really have to, I don't think we do a lot of convincing. I, mean, I think uh, the company has, has grown significantly and has, has grown stronger, so we, we I don't think that the people, and I'm not sure how it is for Gary, but I think when we hire people, we don't necessarily understand, like, are you really passionate about grocery? Um, we really find people that are passionate about uh, local businesses. We find people that are very mission-oriented. They want to kind of change the world. They want to enable these local independent businesses to compete against Amazon and Walmart, and that kind of David versus Goliath story is something that's very important to them. Um, and I'm sure this is also the case with Ursa, is that the data that we access when we work with these grocers is a data set that's never really been tapped into before. So it's like skiing fresh powder. I mean, it's really a, a unique opportunity for them to work on a problem that no one else has really tapped before. And, and so when you combine the fact that we're in a very high growth space, working with a very unique problem set with these local businesses that are very passionate about serving their communities, and we can be their kind of elite special forces on the technology side, uh, it's, it's a very exciting partnership. And so we try to also, uh, I think one thing that you heard from all of the panelists is culture is very important to all of us. You kind of, you want culture that kind of is dripping off the walls. It's like people really, really feel the, the culture of the place. And so we use that as a big uh, litmus test when we bring in candidates. You know, for our culture, it's always about there's nothing a sacred mentality. We look for people that want to channel lose the status quo, and we try to find that in their, in their resumes. Uh, second is intellectual curiosity. We find that people that have hobbies or interests outside of their job, and when you find those, it kind of brings and adds to the environment. It also means that when they find that opportunity in the company, they're going to really dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper. And then lastly, uh, and you can see with me, enthusiasm makes ordinary people extraordinary. We like to get people that are very fired up and passionate about what they do because you can't fake that, you can't buy it. It comes across in the work. Your clients will feel it, their customers and guests will feel it, and then that passion really uh, is, is a big part of it. So 
when you combine all that, that's why I think we, we've been able to have been so successful at attracting and, and recruiting talent for the area. The, the thing about, you know, what is the culture of this place? And it's, it's about generations, it's also about new people coming in. And it's, it's, there's this odd thing about, like, Amazon allows some people to be here who maybe couldn't be here, but they're here because of so many reasons to want to be in Ithaca uh, and, and uh, being able to get this kind of stuff shipped in from all over the world gives them that kind of access, but at the same time, they're really valuing the stuff that is here, the stuff that is multi-generational, that goes back. You know, why did, why did Ezra Cornell come to Ithaca, New York? I mean, he moved here from Syracuse for a reason in the, like, 1820s, 30s. He did that little pipe that went down the, down the uh, Fall Creek and truck moved about three mills, ran off of a piece of technology that he engineered as a young man. Then he went off and made his fortunes, and then he came back to Ithaca again to invest here. And uh, it's a very exciting place. You guys, I uh, loved your comment about the enthusiasm uh, and the importance of that in people, and I think all four of you have this incredible, deep kind of enthusiasm for what you're doing, commitment, and it's just wonderful to see and a great benefit to all of us mm -hmm. uh, to have that energy here in Ithaca. So thank you again. Thank you again for all the work you do and uh, for sharing with us today. Really appreciate it, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.